Wait, what's that noise? Oh, shit. You might notice that my voice sounds a little rough, and that this video is somewhere between kind of late and expectedly late for fuck's sake. That's because I spent the last couple of weeks with some sort of virus. It weirdly started around the same time that I started playing Metal Gear Solid 5 for the first time, and no, that's not a joke reference, I've actually been really ill. Now, I'm not saying that Metal Gear Solid 5 was so bad that playing it made me sick. I want to save that joke for when I get around to actually covering the game. I'm just saying that the timing is suspicious. Also, Nick is still hanging around, so that's a thing, I guess. <coughs> the bridge is gone, Gustav is dead, Madnar is a traitor and also a prisoner, and now Grey Fox is running around in Metal Gear. Things are looking pretty grim, but we still got a mission to complete. Madnar is out there somewhere and we need to know what he knows. Also, I guess we should probably do something about the giant walking death machine. And weren't we meant to be saving someone? So how are we gonna cross this crevice? Well, when you walk back towards Zanzibar Tower, Holly calls to remind you that there's a veranda in the tower building that gets used for parachute jump training, and if you have a hang glider, she says, you can jump straight from there to the other side of the crevice, because in a game that's had turncoat mad scientists, wall crawling grenadiers, a former Olympic runner turned terrorist, and child, hang gliding my way to victory isn't really that far-fetched. The hang glider is all the way back in building one. While we're here, we also want to pick up the blue card, in part because it makes getting around a little easier, but mostly because cards 5 and 6 are still, um, wet from the bridge incident. In this room in the hangar. Yes, the hang glider is in the hangar. Japan fucking loves their puns, I'm certain this was deliberate. And maybe you've seen this room on the radar from the beginning of the game. You notice these dots lined up and maybe thought to yourself, man, that must be a highly guarded room. Are those cameras? Maybe an around-the-clock security detail? No, it's just more mannequins, because Big Boss clearly lost his damn mind in the Outer Heaven explosion, and, sparing no expense, keeps Zanzibar land in line not through engendered loyalty, but mannequin-based fear. Heading back to the tower, the veranda that Holly was talking about is on the 20th floor, so we can take the basement lift straight there. Except no, we can't. Snake did that thing again, where he used the radio to discuss his plans, the radio that has been demonstrably compromised since the very beginning of the mission. So now Grey Fox calls you for my favorite moment in this entire game. There's so much more dialogue in Metal Gear 2 than there was in the first game, so you might have noticed that I dropped the funny voices this time around. There's only so much you can fit into each video, you know, and I'm not exactly chasing a career in voice acting. But just for this moment, just for this one section, I'm gonna do the voices. Consider it a treat. Snake! Snake! It's me, Grey Fox! Fox. You should have listened to my warning, Snake! Now I'm afraid our friendship is at an end! <laughs> he sent mercenaries after you that sound suspiciously like running man's nerve gas. A top secret assassination squad called the Four Horsemen. They only take orders from the president, and that only raises more questions. Which president? I have to assume the US president, given the American-centric nature of this game's story. Does that mean the US government is secretly backing Big Boss? Um, uh, actually, nah, probably not. Standing in the rough path of where these guys jump down to stops them from doing exactly that, but will open up the way for the guys opposite them to come down and start taking shots at you. If you're fast enough to turn and fire on them as they line up with you, it'll scare them off, stopping them from shooting you while they run. The problem with this though is that you'll run out of ammo pretty fast if you just keep spraying and praying, and you still need to be fast on that draw or you're going to be taking at least a few shots. The first time I played this fight, I got through it by the grace of all the rations I had on me at the time, but the entire recording of my first playthrough came out as six-ish hours of complete silence. I don't know how that happened. I can only assume it was the work of the Lali Lule Lo, right. taking extraordinary right. measures. They're playing Patriot games with me. <clears throat> you know, it's a clear and present day. So on my second playthrough, I just used the bandana and held down the fire button. They each explode as you kill them, as is tradition, and the last of them drops card 7, but your victory is short-lived as the elevator then plummets 19 fucking floors. The longest fall in an elevator anyone has been known to survive was 75 floors, and that was back in 1945 when elevators were probably still made from asbestos and tetanus. So while 19 floors might not seem like a massive drop, it should still be noted that most normal people, myself included, would both shit and or piss themselves in that scenario before immediately immediately dying. And Snake just walks away from that shit like it's nothing. You know, it's badass moments like this that make you momentarily forget that Snake is a borderline sex pest. I guess we're taking the stairs then, which means finally going to floor 10, which is mostly sealed up and you have to blast your way through with plastic explosives. 
maybe I'm not a good person. And this kid tells you that while he was playing somewhere to the south, he found some green pineapples. There's plenty of useful stuff in each of these rooms, lots of ammo and refills, so of course you know some shit is coming. And Lo, stepping out onto the stairway... Run. Just run. There's no end to these guys, I checked. And yeah, you have to run up 10 flights worth of stairs, so that's 40 goddamn screens you're running through, with guards crawling up your ass, trip wires, and more fucking pit traps. Fuck you, grey fucks, this is your fault! <sighs> and then finally, when you get to the top and step up to the veranda, your number one fan calls you to tell you that you need to figure out which way the wind is blowing so you can time your jump correctly. The only real way to do that is with the cigarettes, which when equipped, produce smoke, which I guess lets you see which way the wind is blowing from how it wafts away from Snake. Every time I've done this, the smoke has always just billowed upwards, so even though your fan caller says you only get a tiny window to jump, I'll confidently say right now that you could probably jump at any time you want. I'm actually Fox Tank. You can't jump at all unless you use the cigarettes first. So you're actually not timing anything, and smoke means nothing. <sighs> yes, thank you. Anyway, so just jump off with the hang glider equipped. This is another parachute situation, except this time the game isn't cruel enough to just let you fall to your death if you don't have it equipped. It just won't let you jump off if you don't have it in hand. And then we're treated to the slowest but coolest hang gliding cutscene in existence. Oh, this is cool too. So when you land, if you pull up the radio, Snake will... look completely the same. Wait, I thought he was meant to... No, that's actually supposed to happen, but the way this easter egg gets explained is usually wrong. The way you'll see it written most places online is that after the hang glider scene, if you pull up the radio, Snake will have a cigarette in his mouth in reference to the one you smoked right before hang gliding. In fact, the cigarette will be in Snake's mouth during radio calls at any time, as long as you have the cigarettes equipped to the item slot. The cigarette also appears on the opposite side from where it did in the original version. Oh yeah, and Snake actually used to look like Mel Gibson. That jab at the Japanese manual a couple of episodes ago wasn't just a throwaway joke. That is actually who they based his likeness on at the time, and uh, who that didn't age well, huh? Most of the other portraits were styled after actors or other famous figures. Big Boss was Sean Connery, Madnar was Einstein, Kazla was Dolph Lundgren, I think Campbell may have been Kevin Spacey, Master Miller is clearly supposed to be the love child of John Cusack and Elon Musk, and, of course, Curly Howard over here. A lot of the characters had their names changed for one reason or another, usually just romanization of the spellings, though Natasha Markova was changed completely to be Gustava Hefner, and the only reason I can find for that is that it might have been to avoid confusion with Natasha Romanenko, since these changes all took place after the release of Metal Gear Solid. Also, her death portrait used to look like this. Yeah. Take it all in. Ostensibly, the portraits were changed to bring their appearance in line with the Yoshi Shinkawa style that was, by that time, iconic for the series, but also, probably, you know. Much like the original Metal Gear, the first wave of changes came with a mobile re-release of the game in 2004. Aside from the portraits, other changes included shortening the time on some in-game activities that require you to wait, cigarettes now drain life when they were equipped, and the pack on the intro screen was changed from Bao Mao, an obvious play on Pao Mao, to something more generic and less syllable. The controls were updated to be more responsive, with Crouch now getting its own button because apparently on the MSX, you had to press the punch and weapon buttons at the same time to get Snake to crawl, and wow, that sounds awful! Tap codes were changed, as were some of the frequencies, and some bosses had their HP nerfed. All these changes carried over to the PS2 version of the game, which was included with Metal Gear 3 Subsistence, and that's the version I'm playing now. Emulated, of course. I have the original game, but for the purposes of recording, it's just so much easier to... You know, Fox Tank, if you were a real fan, you'd use a capture card to play on an actual MSX, because only fake fans use emulation. Okay, stop it. For everything you've seen so far, I haven't shown you everything. Metal Gear 2 is probably about as long as the first game, but you can probably clear it way faster than intended because you can just skip so much stuff. Of all the equipment you can pick up in the game, you haven't and won't see me use RC missiles, body armor, a camouflage mat, an oxygen tank, binoculars, infrared goggles, 
Night Vision Goggles. A tape of the Zanzibar Land National Anthem that makes guards catatonic whenever it's played. Like seriously, you can just walk up to them and beat them to death in front of their friends. It's weird and hilarious. These weird DDR grenades. A computer mouse? A bucket. Just a literal bucket. And cold medicine. These things do have functional uses in the game, it's just that you can get by perfectly fine without ever touching them. The mecha designer, Tomohiro Nishio, kept exceeding the game's ROM limit while working on Metal Gear D, which meant that the smaller Metal Gear Gs that Madnar mentioned earlier in the game were the first things to be cut. They were going to be in the hang area of the first building instead of the Goliath tanks and on the production line in the next room over. The Goliath tank was also a cut boss, as was something called Maniac Cop, and considering what we've already experienced so far this game, I wish we could have seen what the developers would openly attach the name Maniac to. In the same interview that all of this was revealed by the dev staff, they also said that the game was meant to have wires, which I'm not sure what that's referring to since wires kinda still are in the game, searchlights, piranhas, and flying soldiers which I'm fucking glad were cut, fuck those guys. The story also changed a lot since development began on the game. In game, the Cold War is sort of fizzled out by 1999, but in the crushing existence we call reality, it actually ended in 1991, though the guys camped out in my backyard might have something to say about that. At the risk of sounding cliche, the world was a very different place in the 80s. The fear of nuclear war was very real to the average person, and history was in the making. In the time that this game was being developed, the world witnessed the Tiananmen Square massacre, a sweep of revolutions through the Eastern Bloc, which culminated with the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the eventual dissolution of the Soviet Union. For a developer making a game with a story fueled by political intrigue, that's a lot to keep up with. At the same time, the game was also meant to have a story about a nuke being stolen on US soil, but that was rejected for being too unrealistic, so perhaps some might consider this time to be quaint in its expectations. To try and get into the mindset of a wetworks agent, the development team took something of a Daniel Day-Lewis approach, meaning that this game started taking over their lives. Every photo you see in the manual for equipment was brought in by a staff member with Kojima even saying at one point that his desk was just overflowing with military gear. They would watch and read mountains of military fiction, met with that green beret that I mentioned in the first episode, and even started playing laser tag in a local forest. And look, I've worked in games dev, and let me tell you, that shit does not happen anymore. At least it didn't for me. Slaving away in the test dungeons, buried under half a ton of developer kits and production requests. All of this research built up to the improvements in the soldier behavior you see in this game compared to the first. Kojima wanted to aim for for a simulation feel, you see. Toward the end of development, things hit a snag when Kojima and his team were pulled from Metal Gear 2 to help out with the team working on SD Snatcher, an RPG update to the original Snatcher, also developed by Kojima and his team in 1988. The team were ultimately able to get both games together, and while I can't find anything that specifically states this, I can almost guarantee that two games being completely finished back to back in the same year was only achieved through an unhealthy amount of crunch. Whether because of this interruption, or just because he was inspired by his previous works, Snatcher references made their way into this game, and Metal Gear references made their way into SD Snatcher. The whale cuisine quote from Campbell earlier in the game is a reference to whale meat being found in the stomach of a murder victim. There's also a mention in the Metal Gear 2 manual about a north-south talk, which is in direct reference to a background plot of Snatcher. And the last reference, well, we'll get to that. Despite a lot of retconning to Metal Gear 2's story over the years, it's still a very critical game story-wise to the overall series, and fans have been asking for a remake of this in the original Metal Gear for ages. Not that it matters now, what with Konami and Kojima having broke up in the most dramatic fashion possible. He would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony to uh, accept um, any awards. But in 2012, Kojima confirmed for the third time publicly that he had no plans to remake the original games, due to the amount of story rewriting it would take. That means that, as of this year of our Lord Nurgle 2021, any such project depends entirely on Konami. How are they handling the franchise these days? Oh. Actually... Hmm. Hmm. Excuse me a second. Also, the true canon is what Kojima says is canon, so just take the L and shut up. And people shouldn't give shit to Konami. We wouldn't have Metal Gear without them. But why haven't we got a remake of Metal Gear 1 and 2 yet? Kojima's been posting Metal Gear stuff again, but it won't be long now before we see him come back with Metal Gear Hills. Silence Asher. Then we'll blow this little blue box. This is the last major area of the game, and if we head over to the right, there's some trucks being loaded, and beyond that is the sort of compound that has functioning laser beams in 1999. Because Big Boss might guard his sports equipment with literal dummies, but this shit's important, okay? 
So I'm left with the question of how I'm gonna get in, and I know I haven't had the best luck with trucks in the past, but just hear me out, I have an idea. It apparently has to be night before they'll shut off the perimeter security. According to this girl that's being kept in this locked shack over here, outside the fortified perimeter wall. Now, I don't know about you, but turning off the autonomous security measures while visibility is at its lowest and your security retires for the evening is the most sense-making idea I've ever heard. But I just can't wait around because this game doesn't have a day-night cycle. I'll need to do something to trigger it, and that's where these trucks come in. See, there's this one over here that I can't get onto because it's coming out of the truck, meaning it's being unloaded, right? And off to the west is a truck that's taking in supplies. So maybe if I get into this one over here, I'll come back out over on the east side at night, or better yet, they'll just take me straight into the base. It's worth a try, right? I mean, it's not like I'm gonna end up back over at the hangar of the tower. They destroyed the Brit- How? How did you do that? Ah, <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! What? No! How? I didn't even realize that I'd lost it. Fuck, come on. I've done so much backtracking for this. Just, Master Miller, help me out here. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, yeah, fuck it. You're right, Master Miller. You're so right. I should be having fun with this game, especially when there is fun to be had. No more backtracking. I'm just gonna reload. Okay, so you want to know how you actually get into that compound? First, we need to head over to the left here and into an indoor wheat field where you find Jungle Evil, formerly Predator in the original version, and it's probably right and proper that the name was taken away from him in the updates because this isn't a real boss fight. This guy isn't a real boss. He sucks just as hard as Red Blaster. Even the game knows that those two aren't real bosses, leaving them off the boss rush list entirely while it still includes Metal Gear D, which of course it would have to, but, well, we'll get to that. Jungle Evil dips into the grass as soon as the fight starts, which kicks off a game of whack-a-mole if the mole was arthritically slow, and every time the mole reappeared, you shot it in the face. The only reason you can't kill him as quickly as Red Blaster is because sometimes he'll just fuck off to one of the other three screens and you have to wait for him to come back. This fight isn't difficult, it's just tedious. He drops a card here, but you're also going to want to come over to this side and pick up this one that's hidden in the grass that you'll only otherwise find out about when you get to the part where you actually need it and your creepy stalker calls to tell you that you have to come all the way back to here. Following so far? Good. Head up through this door, put on your gas mask, and get ready to door dance your way through to the right side where you'll pick up one egg, and then charge through the trip wires over to the other side where you'll pick up another egg. You only need one of these eggs, but I couldn't tell you which one exactly, but in this version of the game, they'll almost be ready to hatch by the time you've reached where you parked the hang glider. You're gonna want to keep a close eye on them around this point, because one of the eggs hatches as an owl. He's cool. We'll need him. The other one hatches a snake, who's an asshole, and if you don't immediately get rid of him, he'll crawl away from his egg and eventually reach your rations, which it'll eat, and you'll just have to watch it do that, because you can only get rid of the snake when it's crawling over its eggshell, and the only way you'll have known that for the first time around is if you'd called Johan in time. And you're gonna need those rations, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, we need to convince the guards to turn off the security, which we do by equipping the owl, which hoots, and convinces the guard that it's actually nighttime. And no, I'm not making that up, that's actually in the game. Make your way through to this little shed here. Then we go through this one that has those weird death machines, and seriously, what other purpose do these things serve besides being lethal obstacles? Does OHS know about these? And then out the other side and into this ominous looking room with an elevator which takes you down to the next boss fight. And for all that, you're probably thinking, wait, is he gone? Fuck, okay. So for that, you're probably thinking, Boy, that sure was a lot to go through just to get into the building. Was it worth it, Fox Day? Not immediately, no. The payoff is facing Night Fright, which may or may not be a reference to the 1985 movie Fright Night. It's hard to tell because his name was originally Night Sight, but it changed at the same time they changed Predator to Jungle Evil. It tracks for the timeline, but I don't know why they'd remove one reference while adding another. Maybe someone in the port team was just a huge fan of Vamp. You might have noticed a distinct lack of an actual boss in this room, and that's not a mistake. He's using stealth camouflage, which you won't get until Metal Gear Solid. If you call Kazla, he'll basically shit his pants at the name of Night Fright. Fright Night? Night sight? 
and tell you that you're fucked, but your fan stalker will tell you that you have to listen for his footsteps to figure out his location. See, the arena split up into four areas, like they usually are, each one with a different surface so they'll make different noises when they're walked across. And you're meant to use this to lure him into tight corridors so you can get a shot in on him before dodging out of his way. Here's the thing, that's a pain in the ass to do, and I did it once already. So instead, I just equipped the bandana and machine gun, lured him into this particular choke point here, and just held down the fire key to keep him in his pain state until he died. It's not cheating if the game lets you do it. After you beat Night Fright, head over to the right and a door will open up that leads to a corridor with sulfuric acid splashed all over it, for the rats you see, which fucking melts Snake if he touches it. This is why you need the rations, the ones in the brown tin in particular, because there's chocolate in these rations, and the chocolate neutralizes the acid, and I'm not saying they stole this from MacGyver, but I'm pretty sure they stole this from MacGyver. That's not even the most annoying thing to happen in the next 60 seconds. Snake walks up to examine Mar's body and it immediately becomes apparent that Madna fucking choked him to death. Madna tries to gloss over this murder by shilling for Konami in the MSX, but makes the classic blunder of saying the quiet part out loud. Holly calls you at this point to out him as a double agent for Zanzibar Land due to his new status as a pariah in the scientific community. It turns out that people tend to frown upon developing a walking battle tank with nuclear capabilities for a rogue state. Madnar comes clean about his involvement, revealing to Snake the life he's led since the Outer Heaven incident, what he'd sacrificed to become embroiled in the world of espionage, and that it was him who arranged Marv's abduction. Also, he could complete Metal Gear, of course. The US only wanted Madnar to participate in normie WMD shit anyway, fucking Star Wars or something. Ronald Reagan. He confesses that he killed Marv because he wouldn't share the secrets of Oilix and, finally, admits to causing Gustavo's death at the bridge because he contacted Fox in the sewer tunnels, which we'd already sort of worked out, but Mad Knight, you were just a piece of shit. Remember that time he told me to ambush a woman in the toilet? He demands that you hand over the key you were given, and we'll get to that, and then somehow the geriatric academic gets the drop on Snake and starts to choke him. He's lost it, man. More dangerous than Red Blaster or Jungle Evil ever were. He's killed and must kill again. And you know how to get him off you, right? Right? The game trained you for this. He hasn't exploded. Is he gonna get back up? <coughs> so that's why you're hanging around. Or what do you want from a stupid YouTuber like me? <coughs> <laughs> no, come on, the cannon is so hotly contested. I mean, what are you gonna do if I don't do this? <coughs> or I'll come back to haunt you. Ah, what the fuck?